This is um, number six in this series of lectures, which brings us up to uh, talking about Nelson Rockefeller, uh, who has been described as the bowerbird of collectors, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that uh, description of him in a minute. Uh, and collecting the stuff, again, this is a quote, that wasn't in the Metropolitan, that is, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So, uh, last week, I focused on the role of museum display in the transformation of ethnographic artifacts into, quote, unquote, primitive art. And in particular, I looked at the work of René Darnoncourt, whose installations of non-Western art at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City had been influenced by both his experience working for the Indian Arts and Crafts Board and selling folk art and antiquities in Mexico City. And I suggested that Darnancourt's dramatic, aestheticized displays of non-Western art helped to entice sophisticated American museum goers to consider these artifacts as art and particularly as art that could be purchased for their homes. What we've not yet focused on is the role that private collectors played. I tried earlier to talk about the role that uh, ethnographic museum curators played, particularly at the turn of the century, in bringing uh, artifacts into ethnographic museums. Today, I'm going to focus on private collectors um, for once there was a critical mass of individuals collecting for their personal pleasure, not just the museum collectors uh, who were collecting and purchasing things for their institution, the commodity value of non-Western objects was also transformed. My theoretical starting point is James Clifford's statement that a history of anthropology and art history needs to see in collecting both a form of Western subjectivity as well as a changing set of powerful institutional practices. So it's that tension between the subjective and the institutional that I'm going to be highlighting today. We need to consider collecting from both of these standpoints and in talking about this man, Nelson Aldridge Rockefeller, uh, as a collector, I've undoubtedly chosen to focus on one of the United States' most illustrious art collectors. There are many others who uh, did not have the fame nor fortune that Rockefeller did. Um, and his family has been referred to as the American Medicis. Because Nelson Rockefeller managed to amass three world-class collections of modern art, primitive art, and folk art, we should perhaps see him as an exceptional example of a Western form of subjectivity uh, in that sense of self that encompasses in collecting wealth, erudition, passion, philanthropy, politics, memorialization, and of course, sheer egotism. In writing about collecting in these terms as a Western form of subjectivity, I'm reminded of a comment that Holger Jebbins made earlier uh, when I was talking about collecting. Um, and he reminded us that it's also a non-Western activity. Um, reflecting on this idea, I realized that uh, the type of collecting that I'm familiar with in Melanesia um, represents a different form of subjectivity one that promotes a group's interest rather than the individual's. And here I'm thinking about the collecting of pig's jaws that decorate a men's house in New Guinea uh, after the slaughter and consumption of these pigs. Uh, or the boar's tusk ornament that, and dog's teeth ornaments that a clan group accumulates to display on important occasions. This is indeed collecting. These objects are considered to be valuables, they're considered to be heirlooms, they're often uh, given from one generation to another. 
But in contrast to the West's emphasis on collecting an individual subjectivity, in Melanesia, the purpose of collecting is to enhance the reputation of a group. However, both of these types of collecting are embedded in powerful institutional practices that have important political and economic implications. In my discussion of Nelson Rockefeller as a collector, I intend to analyze then both the subjective dimensions of his motivation to collect non-Western art and the important institutional connections between his collection of primitive art and 20th century American politics. And I'll refer, be referring to the term primitive art today uh, as, uh, with the idea that I'm talking about this moment in the United States in the 40s and 50s where indeed it was collecting primitive art that people considered themselves doing. So I'm going to use that term. Um, I begin with a quote about Rockefeller um, as a collector that was made by a curator at the Museum of Primitive Art, a museum that was founded by Rockefeller and Rene Darnoncourt in New York City in 1957. And I will also be discussing that museum today. Um, the quote is, why anyone who is not a squirrel or a pack rat or a bowerbird collects anything Heaven only knows, wrote Douglas Newton. At least, he continued, one hopes that heaven knows, for nobody has a clear opinion about the process. Not even that inveterate accumulator, Sigmund Freud. Expanding his reference to the bower bird, a tropical bird found in New Guinea, Newton continued, the bower bird's motives are clear enough, he disposes pretty oddments around his bower in a display intended to tempt his prospective mate. It's pleasing and slightly flattering to note that this art collector among birds is, on just these grounds, said by ornithologists to be further up the evolutionary rungs than his more glamorous relatives, the evervescently plumed birds of paradise. I should mention that uh, Douglas Newton also uh, collected uh, and wrote about the art of New Guinea. So he was familiar with both bower birds and uh, birds of paradise. But he goes on to say, why primitive art? And at that, what is primitive art? He then recounted a riddle he had heard from his former boss at the Museum of Primitive Art, Robert Goldwater. And the riddle goes as, question. What's primitive art? The answer, the stuff that isn't in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So this was a little insider joke. Although I did not dwell on their friendship last week, I think it will become clear this week just how much Rene Darnancourt owed his career at the Museum of Modern Art to Rockefeller. I point this fact out not to detract from Darnancourt, uh, and his ability as a curator or exhibition designer. Rather, I want, in contrast, to highlight the powerful institutional relationship Rockefeller had with the Museum of Modern Art. It's a relationship that began with his mother helping to found the museum and continued with Nelson's role as president of the museum's board of trustees. Since many of you, and uh, here he is uh, with his mother, um, since many of you may not be familiar with Nelson Rockefeller's role in American politics and culture, I'm going to very briefly highlight some of the aspects, just so you get some sense of uh, the degree to which he was a prominent American uh, politician. He was one of six children born to Abigail Aldridge Rockefeller and John D. Rockefeller, who was heir to his father's uh, Standard Oil fortune. Uh, he was born in 1908, sent to progressive private schools in New York City, graduated from Dartmouth College in 1930 with a degree in economics. But 
he also had an interest in art that he had nourished with art history courses, the collection of early American furniture, and the editorship of the College Arts Journal. So the fields of economics and art would remain intertwined throughout Rockefeller's prominent career as a politician, a businessman, and a patron of the arts. In particular, Rockefeller combined his concern for the safety of the Rockefeller dynasty's oil fields in Mexico and South America, particularly Venezuela, and his anti-fascist, anti-communist Republican politics with cultural diplomacy centered on the exchange of art and artists, particularly between the United States and Latin America, but also during the Cold War years between the United States and Europe. Although much has been written about the Rockefeller family as art collectors, especially about Rockefeller's parents, less has been written about Nelson as a collector, and especially about his acquisition of art from Africa, Oceania, and the Americas, or his creation of the Museum of Primitive Art. So that's where I started in my interest in Rockefeller was through my interest in understanding more about the creation of the Museum of Primitive Art. Today I examine two aspects of Nelson Rockefeller as a bower bird or collector of non-Western art. On the one hand, a collector can be inspired to collect certain objects as a result of what Alfred Jell has described as art's power to dazzle the viewer, enhanced, as I discussed last week, by the power of display. However, there are many reasons collectors decide to focus on a particular genre of art or object to collect. Some of these reasons include one's upbringing, both informally within one's family and formally through one's schooling as well as the times one lives in, said so the broader historical moment. Nelson Rockefeller attributed his interest in non-Western art to his mother. So Abby Aldridge Rockefeller, he uh, said, um, through her I was fortunate to be able to acquire, by osmosis I guess, an appreciation and enjoyment of art in various forms was not a conscious intellectual effort on my part or a matter of discipline. Thus, primitive art never seemed strange to me. Even though I didn't understand it intellectually, I felt its power, its directness of expression, and its beauty. So I'd like you to remember those motivations on his part. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, Abby Rockefeller, as I said earlier, had been one of the founders of the Museum of Modern Art in 1929. And Nelson had thus grown up uh, surrounded by both modern art, but also African sculpture and Mexican folk art. In many ways, Abby was far ahead of her time in her interests. And once, uh, when traveling in Europe on the eve of World War I, she purchased a watercolor by the German expressionist Eric Haeckel, and it was her first piece of modern art. Um, I'm showing you a painting by the artist Haeckel, not the one that she purchased, but one that you can go see here at the Stato Museum in Frankfurt. They have a number of his works. Um, it was a radical act, her purchase of this watercolor, that went against her husband's conservative tastes in art. Uh, her husband, John D. Rockefeller, purchased the cloisters uh, in France and shipped them over uh, brick by brick to New York City. So if you go to Manhattan now and you take the uh, train up to the Bronx, you can see the cloisters. This is a picture of it. Um, so she and her husband, um, uh, she had of some of her own money and was able to uh, decide how she was going to use that money. Uh, time and again, Abby Rockefeller helped the fledgling Museum of Modern Art. One way it helped it was it provided it with a building. This was a Rockefeller-owned building on 53rd Street that housed the first Museum of Modern Art. Uh, 
She helped the museum with donations of art, money, and eventually property, so much so that the family began to refer to it as Mother's Museum. I suggest, this is what the museum became eventually in 1939, um, and that's uh, the present site of the museum today. I suggest that Nelson Rockefeller's interest in founding the Museum of Primitive Art was in part motivated by his admiration for and his emulation of his mother and her role with the Museum of Modern Art. But even though Abby Rockefeller and her friends underwrote the museum, they were not scholars or curators of art. Uh, that role they left to a brilliant 27-year-old Harvard-trained art historian named Alfred Barr, who directed the museum from 1929 until 1943. Barr believed that New York City needed a museum of modern art to teach Americans about the exciting work that modern artists were doing in Europe. Although most of the Museum of Modern Art's exhibitions of non-Western art were curated by Darnham Core, the impetus for these exhibitions came from Barr, who wanted to educate the public in all the various influences of modern art. So this was a diagram that he um, created. Um, he called it the Torpedo, and um, it was part of a 22-page report he prepared for the museum trustees, and it was his uh, explanation of um, the permanent collection, and the, what the permanent collection at the Museum of Modern Art should consist of. And so he said, you can think of uh, modern art as a torpedo moving through time, and uh, it had various sources that go back in history, and he wanted to present these different uh, historical sources to the American public, including non-European prototypes and sources. So that propeller there that was the inspiration and the motivation for uh, the future of modern art, whatever it might be, and he wanted to leave that really open, um, was uh, things such as both European and non-European uh, early prototypes. In another exhibit that he um, curated in 1936 called Cubism and Abstract Art. He, uh, on the catalog of that exhibit, had another one of his diagrams. And in the middle of it, I just want to point out, he had what, was, what he called Negro sculpture, term that was used at that point for both African and Oceanic uh, art. And so he saw that, uh, placed that in that 1905 uh, period of time that we talked about uh, earlier, where um, the avant-garde artists, modern artists in um, Europe were discovering African masks and oceanic art. So um, he uh, arranged for an exhibition of African Negro sculptures in 1935 at the Museum of Modern Art. and. In 1937, an exhibit that should be familiar to many of you, uh, your own Leo Frobenius arrived in New York. I want to thank both Olga and Richard for the photographs that I'm using today. I've been really interested to know more about what you've been doing vis-a-vis -vis this uh, exhibition and have just started reading about a variety of things that you've done and hear that there may be more. Uh, so, this exhibit uh, was based on Barr having come here to Frankfurt and looked at uh, the rock, um, prehistoric rock pictures that Frobenius had collected. He chose a number of them that he wanted to uh, put on display at MoMA. Of course, these were replications of those rock art drawings. And here's what the uh, exhibition looked like uh, for New Yorkers at the time who were able to come and see these uh, uh, drawings. Barr explained the reason for the uh, exhibit by saying that the art of the 20th century has already come under the influence of the great tradition of prehistoric mural art, 
the formal elegance of the Altamira bison, the spontaneous ease with which the South African draftsman uh, mastered the difficult silhouettes of moving creatures, these are achievements which living artists have admired. And he went on to uh, talk more about how in this exhibit on one floor of the museum, he also had displayed modern art that he felt had been influenced by prehistoric uh, art. So having said something about Barr and his influence on the Museum of Modern Art and the way in which he incorporated non-Western and prehistoric uh, influences, on modern art, I'm going to switch back to telling you some more about Nelson Rockefeller and his career. And I realize I'm jumping back and forth. This isn't a chronological story of Rockefeller, but I hope you'll be able to follow me. Um, so Nelson Rockefeller, as I mentioned earlier, became the president of the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, this was in 1939. And soon after that, he began his political career in Washington, DC. In 1941, when he was appointed by Franklin Delano Roosevelt to be the coordinator of Inter-American Affairs, a job that he uh, relished as he was responsible for uh, improving communication between Latin American nations and the people of the United States in order to prevent fascist influence growing in Latin America. Um, you may not be interested in all the details of this, but he proposed this position as a Republican politician to a Democratic president, FDR, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt indeed thought he was the man to take on this job. Uh, one of the first things he did was to enlist the aid of Walt Disney, sending him to Latin America to make a series of movies for the American public that would introduce them to the people and cultures of Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and Peru. And recently there in the United States has been um, interest in these films and the uh, experience of uh, Walt Disney and his artists in South America. So there is a documentary film that's just come out called Walt and El Grupo that uh, shows um, that uh, depicts their, um, the time that they spent in Latin America. Um, they also uh, created short films that were translated into Spanish for Latin American audiences. So there were films that went in both directions, films about Latin America for Americans, films about the United States for uh, uh, Latin Americans. Rockefeller also hired Rene Darnacourt to help the Office of Inter-American Affairs, remember Darnancourt had worked in Mexico, um, with two projects. One of them drew on his extensive experience in Mexico and um, among Native American artists, and it involved him working with craftsmen in South America to advise them and their governments on ways that their products could be made more marketable. The other project entailed Rockefeller putting Darnham Corps in charge of a newly established international exchange program at the Museum of Modern Art that focused on organizing the exchange of art and artists between the United States and Latin America. So here, I hope you begin to see this uh, uh, interconnection that uh, Rockefeller was able to create between his position down in Washington, his relationship with the Museum of Modern Art, and his idea that through art and artists, um, this was an important way for different cultures to get to know something about one another. It was, from one perspective, an overtly political endeavor, the Museum of Modern Arts, and it was underwritten, this exchange by Rockefeller money, to encourage mutual understanding and respect, um, rather than um, through cultural diplomacy. This has been criticized by some leftists you know, who have said that it was a form of cultural imperialism. Um, on the other hand, uh, Rockefeller was also um, concerned with uh, making sure that the Rockefeller oil enterprise um, uh, 
was not harmed by uh, uh, fascist influences. So it's a murky period in terms of um, this idea of cultural diplomacy in the United States. Finally, Rockefeller uh, was governor of New York from 1959 until 1973. There was a movement to nominate him as the Republican candidate for president in 1964, but he lost uh, to the conservative Barry Goldwater. And then after Nixon's impeachment in August of 1974, Rockefeller served as vice president under President <laughs> Gerald Ford until 1977. Rockefeller died at the age of 70 in 1979. So he rose very high in the echelons of um, American uh, federal politics, but uh, never did become president, which was his ultimate desire. Let us return to Rockefeller the collector. His own collecting of non-Western art began when he was 22. He said, the first piece of primitive art that I collected personally was a beautiful and simple wooden bowl, here it is, which I found in Hawaii on a trip around the world in 1930. That trip was a nine month honeymoon trip with his first wife, Mary Todd, and it had been a wedding present from his parents. As Rockefeller explained, I couldn't resist the bowl, and I still get satisfaction from the shape of it, the grain of the wood and the warm, soft patina that came from centuries of loving care. In Sumatra, he wrote, we drove through tropical jungles dotted with clearings of little villages with thatched houses, their ridge poles upturned. In one, I discovered and purchased some interesting pieces a dagger and a lute. So here we have the dagger on the left and the uh, lute right. Um, that evening, I proudly showed these pieces to the Dutch manager of the government rest house where we spent the night. Much to my chagrin, he thought nothing of my purchases. His comment was that all the good pieces of primitive art had been burned by the missionaries years ago and what was available now was manufactured in Germany, sent out for the tourist trade. Inasmuch as fewer than 100 tourists had stayed at this guest house for that year, this struck me as a rather cynical point of view. In any event, I still have and enjoy the dagger and lute as the joyful expression of a people with a love of beauty. In Bali, Rockefeller continued, amid the splendors of nature and a joyful people, I found a small, old, wooden figure of a woman, carved simply and expressing great feeling. I was beginning to learn the excitement and thrill of discovering beautiful things on my own. While in Bali, he also met Miguel Covarrubias and his wife. This was, there, it was Covarrubias' first trip to Bali before he returned with his Guggenheim Fellowship and Miguel and his wife, Rosa, encouraged the Rockefellers to visit Mexico. And a few years later, they did. So here we see Rockefeller in Mexico with Rosa Covarrubias, as well as Rockefeller at a um, pre-Columbian um, archaeological site. Still experiencing the headiness of the Mexican Revolution, Artists such as Covarrubias, Diego and his wife, uh, Frida Kalho, here we see both uh, Rivera and Frida Kalho, um, were intent on celebrating contemporary indigenous folk art, which I've talked about before, as well as on collecting pre-Columbian art. When Rockefeller traveled to Mexico in 1933, he met these artists and he began to collect Mexican folk art as well as supporting various of the archaeological uh, digs. Uh, he continued throughout his life to collect um, Mexican folk art and he was interested in actually talking with the artists who uh, made the objects that he purchased. Once again, Rockefeller was probably influenced by his mother's fascination with American folk art. She created a museum of American folk art. Um, 
uh, as well as Abby's own interest in Mexican folk and modern art. Uh, since during this period, she was a benefactor of Diego Rivera, as well as a good friend to Frida Kalho. So uh, there are interesting conversations in her biography that she had with Frida. Um, Frida was pregnant at the time, and Abby was helping her. And, uh, so it was a quite intimate relationship. In 1940, Rockefeller engaged Miguel Covarrubias to curate an exhibit at MoMA entitled 20 Centuries of Mexican Art. Uh, so these are some of the things that Rockefeller collected. Uh, this lacquerware from Otitlan that I had told you that uh, Darnancourt had helped um, to uh, um, revive uh, other types of folk art. He has given his, his folk art exhibit, uh, collection is now in two museums in the United States. Uh, one in San Antonio at the San Antonio Museum of Art and the other is in San Francisco. So the collection was divided between these two museums. And here's the cover from the um, exhibition uh, at the Museum of Modern Art that uh, was um, undertaken uh, at the instigation of uh, Nelson Rockefeller. And uh, here are some of the folk art objects that were on display. Um, one of the other things that um, Rockefeller did uh, as president of um, the Board of Trustees at the Museum of Modern Art, um, well, I'll come back and talk about that in a minute. Uh, to answer Douglas Newton's question that I posed earlier about why collect primitive art, or more specifically, why it was of interest to Nelson Rockefeller, it would seem to have been the combination of his socialization into his mother's world of avant-garde and modern art, which allowed him to see primitive folk and modern art as aesthetically connected to one another, and his development of a personal philosophy about the universal significance of all types of art. Rockefeller believed what anthropologist Sally Price has identified as a prevalent ideology among many collectors of tribal art, that, quote, art as a universal language expresses the common joys and concerns of all humanity. And I wanted uh, you to think back to the number of times in the quotes that I made, uh, quoted from Rockefeller, that he used the word joy, joyful people, uh, joyful expression of their cultures, uh, so this, he was very much a part of this universalizing uh, ideology, um, a feeling that um, non-Western art expressed. Uh, you didn't need to know anything about the people themselves. You appreciated this art because of its form. Uh, Thus, in addition to personal ambition and the desire to accumulate social and cultural capital, if we want to add uh, these kind of Bordeauxian ideas about some of Rockefeller's motivation, um, Rockefeller also believed that art was, quote, a source of faith and hope, of inspiration to people throughout the world, and that it was a great pinnacle of human achievement. The purest, and this is his, these are his words again, the purest expression of human energy, creativity, and spirituality. As I mentioned earlier, Rockefeller amassed these three world-class collections of um, three different genres, Mexican folk art, primitive art, and modern. In fact, at one point in New York City in 1969, there were three concurrent exhibits uh, of all three of his collections. So the Museum of Modern Art had, a collect had displayed his collection of modern art. The Metropolitan Museum of Art displayed his collection of primitive art. And the Museum of Primitive Art displayed his collection of Mexican folk art. His modern art collection, as I said, uh, included paintings and sculptures by Cubas, Futurists, Fovis, Dadas, and abstract expressionists, and he purchased Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, 
for the Museum of Modern Art, where it now resides. He had 700 pieces of Mexican folk art and 1,000 objects in his collection of art from Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. However, it's been said that at a certain point in his political career, when the very ambitious Nelson realized that he was never going to become president of the United States, that he turned his attention to becoming one of the greatest, if not the greatest, art collector in the country, a 20th century American Medici. This is, there's been recently a book about his family, uh, <coughs> calling them the American Medicis. However, when Rockefeller first began to collect Mexican folk art and primitive art, neither types of art were particularly in vogue among the art world conoscenti in uh, the United States. In fact, it was Rockefeller himself who would contribute to the creation of a market for primitive art in the United States once he be decided to become a serious collector. He did not formally begin collecting African and Oceanic art until 1948 when he asked René Darnancourt to assist him. He also, at that point, made Darnancourt the director of the Museum of Modern Art. In an interview in 1969, Rockefeller said, I had read many books about primitive art, studied private collections, went to Africa, and was fascinated by the native art I saw. I returned to New York via Brussels and, visit the, and visited the Tervuren Museum. And for those of you who haven't been to this museum, I'm going to show you just a few slides uh, from the uh, museum, just to give you some sense of what uh, Rockefeller would have seen there in 1948. Uh, the museum, officially called the Musée Royal de l'Afrique Centrale, was founded by King Leopold II in, in 1895, 1895, to promote an understanding in Europe of the commercial value of the Belgian Congo. Today, it houses one of the most complete collections of ethnographic objects and botanical and zoological specimens from Central Africa in the world. He said, as soon as I returned from that trip, I had lunch with Darnancourt and asked him to help me assemble a collection of primitive art from all of the world. That's how my collection of primitive art got started. So uh, he would have seen this elephant uh, with some uh, Africans uh, riding on the back. He would have seen uh, this uh, exhibit. I just went to the Tavuran Museum, so I, uh, the, the tourists, including my photographs in this talk, uh, this room is just incredible. It was, um, this is the way it was designed in 1910. So it's one of the um, rooms that we know Rockefeller would have seen uh, as it's still uh, in, in its original uh, formation there. Um, these are some of the statues that are in the collection that he would have seen. We don't know exactly what it was about seeing the collection of objects from Central Africa on that trip that kindled Rockefeller's desire to collect primitive art. He most certainly would also have seen the exhibit African Negro Art at the Museum of Modern Art in 1935, and thus was also aware of the impact of non-Western art on avant-garde artists. He may also have been excited by the post-war availability of primitive art for sale from European dealers and collectors. In order to advise Rockefeller on what to purchase, Darnancourt relied primarily on published sources, the same books on primitive art that Rockefeller read. He would sketch examples. So here, is, these are his notebooks. These are Darnancourt's notebooks. And um, this is how he went about compiling a list of resources uh, uh, 
books. You know, he divided. Um, I mean, here, here he was given this task uh, or this uh, project to create a world-renowned exhibit, a uh, collection of non-Western art. So he divided the world up into different uh, you know, culture areas. Here we have major culture areas in Oceania. He divided them uh, in different uh, cultural regions. He uh, then um, had references uh, that they would go and look at in terms of uh, examples of things that they would want to collect. So then, as you recall, I had told you that Darnancourt was a talented um, draftsman, sketcher, artist. He loved to draw these actual objects, so he would, in the notebook, draw an example of the object that uh, they should uh, look for to collect. So here we have a Micronesian um, mask. Uh, here's another example of an African uh, sculpture. He'd give information about who had collected this particular object, where they could see a picture of it, and then once they had managed to find an object for Rockefeller's collection, they'd take a photograph of it, and he would put it next to the um, uh, objects that, uh, the, that were representative of, uh, that it was representative of. So he had the desired objects that any good collection should have, and the objects that eventually uh, Rockefeller acquired. For Rockefeller, according to Donancourt, collecting art had an important emotional dimension. It wasn't simply a the sociological, psychological, economic dimensions that I've mentioned already. Um, there's been a lot of work done recently on collecting and the practice of collecting, and these are some of the dimensions that people have talked about. Um, this quote from Darnacore is uh, going to give you some insight into this emotional dimension for Rockefeller. The particular kind of euphoria he receives from art has nothing to do with that gambler's excitement characteristic of many collectors. It's not like Benzedrine. It's a curious combination of excitement and relaxation. Call it solace. Call it therapy. Most men, after a hard day's work, want to relax. One simply feels he enjoys himself more profoundly when he looks at art than in any other activity. Another important element that animated Rockefeller's passion for collecting indigenous art was his friendship with Darnancourt. We see aspects of this friendship in quotes about their collecting from both men. For example, Darnancourt also wrote, during most of the years that I was helping Nelson build up his collection, in the 1950s, he was working in Washington under a severe schedule. Several times when he felt depressed, I would fly there for the night. This is so he'd fly down from New York to Washington, carrying a suitcase filled with small pre-Columbian sculpture, Peruvian gold, other little things to cheer him up. We'd have dinner, look through the objects, and have a wonderful time. During those Washington days when he often looked absolutely gray-green from overwork, his idea of a relaxing rest was to take an overnight plane with me to the West Coast, arrive there at 9 a.m. and carefully examine some 1,000 pieces of primitive art, of which he would buy about 40. He'd return to Washington on the next night plane, looking refreshed, rosy-cheeked, and fit as after a vacation. I return looking gray-green. It's a big responsibility to distinguish the real from the fake in the field of primitive sculpture. So this was Darnancourt's role as a connoisseur to be uh, there uh, assuring that Rockefeller got uh, true value for his purchase. From Darnancourt, we get the sense of the sheer pleasure and relaxation that Rockefeller der derived from viewing art. 
As he carefully pointed out, it wasn't a feeling of addiction or intoxication, a compulsion to complete his, have that complete collection. Um, it was, uh, you know, such as any shopaholic experiences, it was indeed this uh, uh, feeling of uh, joy and delight. In 1953, Rockefeller wrote to Darnon Core saying, Dear Renee, your wonderfully thoughtful letter of the ninth meant a great deal to me. I share your feelings concerning the association we have had in the museum the past years. It's been a very happy period for me. I have taken on this work here in Washington with a tremendous feeling of confidence about the future of the Museum of Modern Art, knowing that the leadership rests firmly in your hands. Your comments about the primitive art collection also mean a great deal to me because I have enjoyed so much working with you in its development. To move forward in this field with you is something I look forward to on a continuing basis. The Malakula piece portrayed in the photograph and your wonderful drawing is absolutely terrific and I think we should act immediately on it. I can't wait to see it and it makes me think we ought to get started on the new museum in the fall. And they did. So they created the Museum of Primitive Art. This is where it was housed in another Rockefeller-owned um, building on uh, 54th Street. The Museum of Primitive Art is a very old dream of mine, Rockefeller told a reporter in 1969. Already in the 1930s, I had tried to get the Metropolitan interested in going into a joint program with the Natural History Museum to collect pieces of Central and South American art, which could then be shown on a purely aesthetic level, not on the ethnological basis on which it had heretofore been shown. But the suggestion did not go anywhere. And although the Museum of Modern Art, as we know, had been exhibiting non-Western art uh, since the 1930s, it had never seriously considered uh, the acquisition of such art as part of its mandate. Thus, when Rockefeller decided to create the Museum of Primitive Art in 1954, it was the first museum of its kind in the world. As anthropologist Paul Vandergroep has pointed out in his anthropological study of collecting, private collections have been an important source for the creation of museums and, quote, the more people participate in public affairs during their pro professional life, the greater is their tendency to donate their possessions to the collectivity, especially in democracies. As we will see, this has been particularly true of Nelson Rockefeller. Rockefeller and Darnacore convinced the art historian Robert Goldwater to direct the new museum. Goldwater, as you may remember, had written this book, Primitivism in Modern Art, based on a dissertation of the same title, and had become a specialist in African art. Not surprisingly, oh, the other thing I was going to tell you about Goldwater that's just, I think, an interesting little um, uh, side um, uh, personal uh, tidbit is that he was married to the artist Louise Bourgeois. And um, Goldwater actually died in um, the early 70s before Louise Bourgeois had become the well-known, uh, world-renowned uh, sculptress that she later became. Uh, so this was a, the, an interesting couple and uh, with a uh, broad range of interests in uh, different types of art. Thus, Goldwater. Uh, as assumption of the directorship of the Museum of Primitive Art, the acquisition process became more formalized and systematic. Uh, and as Kate Ezra, former curator of African art, has written, Goldwater's choices of art were significantly different from those of his two colleagues. They were of higher quality aesthetically, more varied in style, and more representative of important new directions in the collection of African art. So um, Darnancourt, not surprisingly, had been taking a more conservative uh, uh, point of view in looking for what objects he wanted to have Rockefeller purchase. Uh, 
Um, Goldwater, on the other hand, knew more about the varieties of different kinds of African art in particular, and uh, he urged that the museum begin a different, uh, more varied acquisition policy. Thus, Rockefeller's collection of non-Western art can be divided into two periods, the pre-museum of primitive art period and the post-museum of primitive art, each being characterized by a different set of social relations. The earlier period was more informal and personal, initially based on Rockefeller's world travels and his own personal taste. It began as a kind of collecting as souvenir, but gradually came to be shaped by connoisseurship and his close friendship with Darnancourt. In contrast to this more freewheeling initial period, the second period saw the development of a more focused form of collection under the academic direction of Goldwater. In addition to displaying Rockefeller's own collection of tribal art, the museum featured the collection of a range of other individuals, and I'm just going to quickly go through some of the uh, Museum of Primitive Art catalogs to give you some idea. Uh, so what uh, the museum became was not just uh, a uh, means of showing the permanent collection that was Rockefeller's, but it also uh, showed the work of many other collectors, uh, thus uh, highlighting the, these works and uh, increasing the value of these works as well. Uh, so I'll just go through these. And it was African, it was um, pre-Columbian, it was also um, uh, oceanic. The goal of the museum was to educate the American public about the aesthetic value of these so-called primitive masterpieces, which was the first exhibit held at the museum. It was called Masterpieces of Primitive Art, and this is the uh, is a photograph of the initial um, uh, installation that was done by none other than René Darnancourt. Uh, they were displayed with little contextualizing information about the cultures from which they came or the purpose they had served. Instead, they were mounted and spotlighted in a similar manner to objects of fine art, contributing to the transformation of artifacts into fine art. In a 1968 Art News article that praised the Museum of Primitive Art's manner of displaying objects the um, critic wrote, primitive art, when not displayed like a Boy Scouts collection of arrowheads, usually are swamped in raffia, spotlighted with jungle colors, and given a special music of clicks and bongos. The Museum of Primitive Art works with a simple but brilliant idea. It judges its acquisitions and collections by modern aesthetic standards. In other words, by what looks best to the best informed eyes. It does not attempt the impossible act of putting itself in the minds of the primitive artists. It plays it straight. So thus, we see that a hallmark of the Museum of Primitive Art was the continuation of Darnancourt's asceticization of the display of tribal art that he had begun at the Museum of Modern Art. From its inaugural exhibition in 1957 until its demise in 1975, media coverage of the new museum in art journals, newspapers, and television specials enthusiastically praised its exhibitions and thus contributed to the growing craze among urban sophisticates in the United States for all things primitive. So I'm going to show you now just a few of Darnancourt's sketches for various um, uh, installations at the Museum of Primitive Art. Here's one about the, the Melanesian art. Uh, here we have a, another Melanesian object, an Admiralty Islands bowl. Uh, here are a couple of sketches from a Peruvian gold exhibit. And I think what you'll gain, or I hope what you gain from these uh, drawings is that there were very few objects and they were um, displayed in um, very dramatic uh, format and also highlighting them as um, 
uh, important objects. And in the next um, uh, few images, I'm showing you some uh, both pictures and text from some of the reviews of the Museum of Primitive Art. Um, so uh, this was the New York Times uh, reviewing a, a 10th anniversary exhibition museum. Uh, here was another uh, popular magazine, Anyone for Primitive Art. And again, I want to give you some sense of what was happening in New York uh, among a much broader public uh, other than the more uh, uh, refined uh, world of, in the 1920s and 30s of collectors over in Europe. By this point in the United States, uh, there was a much broader knowledge. So here, native goes modern a much broader knowledge of primitive art. Uh, Native goes modern in the art world's latest fad as primitive art takes the spotlight from op and pop. So again, we've got the 60s, there are a variety of different kind of art trends going on, and one of them then that uh, becomes, as they're saying, uh, the latest fad is primitive art. And where could you go to see it? The Museum of Primitive Art. Uh, another interesting discourse, this one being that I'm just showing you here, kind of the more popular um, populist, uh, is a religious one. The search for God in primitive art. And what I find interesting about this, this is a missionary journal that came out of a um, Protestant um, uh, mission organization in New York City. And uh, they emphasized um, that kind of a changing discourse about uh, the meaning of these objects. They said that um, all of the cultures that have produced these works of art are dead or dying. You know, so. There are things of the past, but as we look at the way men have tried to express their religious beliefs, we may have a truer understanding of both religion and art. And so they, the um, uh, motivation here among this uh, religious uh, journalist to say that there are uh, many different ways that humans have expressed their idea of God. And so it was a much more ecumenical, broader interpretation uh, of these objects. And in fact, uh, some of you may remember at the beginning I showed you um, one of these figures. It's from the Gambier Islands. It's uh, the head of a figure which probably represents the god uh, Roto or Rongo, um, who uh, was uh, sent rain to nourish the breadfruit trees in the Gambier Islands. And the, but the thing that's it's significant to me about this is that they're acknowledging that missionaries had burned the other of these objects. And there were only, uh, what does it say? Um, well, this may not say, but there are only uh, seven or so that were still um, uh, extant. Uh, and Rockefeller had purchased one of them. Uh, the other one, um, I, two others that I mentioned to you in my, it was my first lecture, are on display now in San Francisco. They're part of the Vatican uh, Museum's ethnological um, collection. So we see by the late 1960s you know, in the United States the beginning of a completely different set of ideas about um, the sacred meaning of these objects, uh, as well as a willingness to say that you know, Christianity has changed in terms of its understanding about the meaning of these objects. What also began in earnest, of course, were the escalating prices and commoditization of primitive art. Thus, another effect of the transformation of Rockefeller's private collection into the Museum of Primitive Art is that the institutionalization of this collection expanded, um, accelerated the expansion of an already growing market for primitive art uh, and concomitantly led to an increase in the value of such objects. 
One of the most publicized examples of this exponential increase uh, in the price paid for primitive art was Rockefeller's purchase in 1958 of an exquisite ivory pendant from Benin. He paid $56,000 for the pendant, the highest price at that time that had ever been paid for an object of primitive art. It was about two inches in height. And um, uh, those of you who are familiar with objects like this will recognize that these are Portuguese um, men along the top um, who have been can tell from their uh, hats. Uh, and um, this sale of this object made the front page of the New York Times. Uh, it was uh, such an astonishing price at the time. Um, other uh, important aspects of the Museum of Primitive Art that it served in terms of what I talked about earlier, uh, cultural diplomacy, is that it mounted exhibits in Paris. I'm sorry this picture is so poor, but this was an exhibit of Native American art that was um, uh, installed um, in the American uh, embassy in Paris that drew a lot of attention. And then they were asked to curate the American art uh, exhibit at the 1958 um, World's Fair in Brussels. This is the Atomium. I don't know how many of you recognize uh, that, but uh, the, the United States had an exhibit of Native American art of um, Jackson Pollock, so um, abstract expressionist art, and jazz. And these three types of art were being um, promoted by Americans uh, in, to talk about the freedom of expression in the United States as a democracy in contrast to the communist world. So this was my reference earlier to art being used as a means of fighting against, um, fighting the Cold War. Um, in uh, Eastern uh, European countries at the time, jazz was forbidden. Uh, it was uh, an outlawed form of musical expression. So the fact that the United States exhibition highlighted this was, again, a means of a contrast to um, the repression in Soviet regimes. Justice Nelson Rockefeller's mother had paved the way for her son's involvement with the Museum of Modern Art by suggesting at the age of 22 that he become um, a, a trustee of the museum, so he, he was first a trustee and then became the president, uh, Nelson made his son Michael, an undergraduate at Harvard with an interest in art and anthropology, a member of the board of trustees of the Museum of Primitive Art. In 1961, Michael had the opportunity to join a Harvard expedition to the interior highlands of Dutch New Guinea, the western half of the island. He was to be the group's photographer, documenting their activities as the filmmaker, Robert Gardner, proceeded to make what became a classic ethnographic film about warfare. Some of you may know this film, Dead Birds, made among the Donny people. Excited by the adventure of being among a remote culture, here are some of the pictures that, he, that Michael Rockefeller took, changed little by the intrusion of Western missionaries and colonization. Here he is with his photographic equipment, and here are some of the, their wonderful photographs that he took. He really captured you know, great uh, intimate moments of uh, children in particular. Um, Michael arranged a smaller expedition to another group in Dutch New Guinea, known for their extraordinary art, the Asma. And this is where, at the beginning, I had wanted to show you more of the Osmond art to sort of bring us back to uh, Michael Rockefeller. The purpose of this trip, as I said, was to purchase Osmond art um, for the Museum of Primitive Art. So here is a photograph of uh, Michael down among in the Osmond in a canoe. Um, however, things did not go as well for Michael on this trip as they had previously. While traveling by canoe, he and his companion ran out of gas for the engine. 
and were swept out to sea. Only Michael could swim, so he set off for shore to get more gasoline. He was never seen again. These are some um, news uh, documents from the time. Uh, this was the entire American nation was riveted to this Pacific search. Um, there were airplanes that went out looking for uh, Rockefeller. Um, Rockefeller and Michael's twin sister Mary flew to Dutch New Guinea where they spent 10 days searching for him by plane before giving up and returning home. However, the magnificent Osmot Ark, the tall beast poles, sculptures, shields, canoe prows, paddles, as well as dance masks, sago bowls, and other objects of daily and ritual life that Michael had collected were shipped back to the United States. Here's Michael and his mo uh, with Nelson and his mother, uh, Nelson and Michael's mother, so Nelson and his first wife, uh, looking at these objects. Uh, in 1962, René Dornancourt curated an exhibition of the Osmot art in the sculpture gardens of the Museum of Modern Art. So this is that uh, exhibit. Uh, it was a tribute to Michael Rockefeller. So I'm now going to conclude. Paul Vandergrip has pointed out that 90%, 90 to maybe 95% of collectors of art premier, another term often used to refer to non-Western tribal art, um, are men. It tends to be more men who are collecting this art than women. In their auto-analysis, he reports, the male collectors emphasize their inability to procreate as an explanation of their need for another kind of creation, that of a superior collection. And here we have um, Nelson Rockefeller showing Beatrice, Princess Beatrice of the Netherlands, uh, some Osmot art. Um, in, although I have no indication that Rockefeller felt a similar motivation for his collection of tribal art. If we were to talk in anthropomorphic terms about the life history of a collection, one could say that Rockefeller's collection of non-Western art went from its infancy, when it began as an amateur avocation, to its maturity when, as it became institutionalized and systematized, it also became more sophisticated and erudite. In 1969, Rockefeller gave the collection, his collection, that made up the Museum of Primitive Art to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's been suggested that he did so because he had suffered financial setbacks, making it too expensive for him to maintain the Museum of Primitive Art. I'd actually like to suggest another reason, uh, one that harks back to the idea of collection as a social relation. When Rockefeller donated um, his collection of primitive art to the Met, his son Michael, for whom the new wing of the Met that would house the collection was to be named, had disappeared in New Guinea. And his friend, René Darnancourt, had been killed in a car accident in 1968. I think that Rockefeller may have been so personally stricken by these losses that he lost the desire to continue the project that he'd embarked upon with Darnancourt. At this time, Rockefeller didn't stop collecting art. He just stopped collecting primitive art. Although I cannot verify this idea, I am certain that Rockefeller felt that with the museums, the Metz Museum's acceptance of his collection and their commitment to the institutionalization of the collection and display of primitive art, he, Rockefeller, had succeeded in a long desired goal of getting the Met to accept non-Western art of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas 
on an equal value as exemplars of human creativity to that of the other works of art displayed at the museum. So I'm going to end there because I will pick up next week with talking about uh, the Met and why the Metropolitan Museum of Art changed its mind and decided to accept uh, non-Western art. Um, so I'll let you ponder that for next week, and I'm happy to take any questions. That you